Please don't take me personal, but I'm gonna be Stephanie for a moment. You probably fast, you probably have high protein. I'm against all of that, hardcore. That's incredible. We're living in a toxic reality. Most people are damaged. They don't sleep well, they don't breathe right, they don't exercise right, they don't walk right. And then you put them on a diet where all of a sudden the hair starts falling out. Wow. People don't do ice baths and intermittent fast because they're trying to lengthen their telomeres and all this kind of stuff. They do it because they want to weigh less on a scale. You need to do this for the therapeutic benefits because if you're healthy on the inside, you're going to be healthy all the way out to the outside. That's incredible. Stephanie, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much, Ryan. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So first things first, I want to start off with your story Um, because I was reading uh, a little bit about how you got introed into keto uh, and it started really with your mom, right? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So my mother was diagnosed with a glioblastoma, which is the most aggressive brain cancer and most people don't survive it, less than 1%. And I had heard about the ketogenic diet prior, but I don't remember from what or where. And uh, the doctors were just so um, pessimistic about her survival. So I I thought, well, I'm going to give this thing a try. And essentially trying to get my mother to change her habits of, she was baking a lot prior to her diagnosis. So um my brother and I had to get rid of a bunch of sugar and bread and and deodorant and cleaning products and just anything that would be considered toxic. And he had her more of a sort of on a plant-based diet. And I was like, yeah, I want to try this keto thing. And so that's where we started. That's where I started. And uh, I also started my journey with doing a ketogenic diet with her mm. to encourage her to do it because it's really difficult to get another person to cut out all these foods, especially when it's not trending and nobody's ever heard about it before. So she obviously survived the glio. Nobody knows exactly what made her survive because there were so many things that we tried, including the the vitamin C infusions and a bunch of stuff. Um, But she's still alive and uh, she stopped doing it, but I still do it and I coach it. That's amazing. Uh, thank you for sharing that. That's incredible. So you've you've been doing keto before keto was a cool kid on the block. Um, tell us kind of how long have you been doing a ketogenic diet um, and has that has your approach to it changed over the years? So I've done it for 16 years, just a little shy of 16 years. Um, I'm yeah, obviously I'm 55 going on 56. I started when I was 40 and um it shifted just because, you know, you know, more my, I learn through people. There's no real studies. I don't think in the way, at least I do it. I remember I worked with a girl who had epilepsy. She was having 25 seizures a day and she was working with a dietitian from John Hopkins, um, uh, hospital. And they had her eat like just ungodly amounts of protein. She was eating like whole chickens a day. And I was like, no, 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 no. That's way too much protein. So my philosophy is moderate to low protein, which I believe Steve Finney and Jeff Fulick in the very beginning, they preached that. So somewhere along the line, when keto started, just started to trend, people start to overconsume protein in my opinion. But in the beginning, I think I, I personally was eating too much fat. I didn't understand the importance of electrolytes. I uh, figured that out myself with my own experience of having problems with tons of stuff. Um, and to me, the, the the carbohydrate on keto was always easy because it was quite low. Right. And now I barely even eat plants. So I'm like more riding the line of carnivore, but still consider myself a ketogenic person. Got it. People now, became more interested. So in the protein, beginning, I'd that? say like- that... I think that men, based on my experience, so in the, I've been doing this for years, years and years and years and years, and I've used, uh, because I was a person working with people with glucometers, mm. so I go by, because I know you can't quantify your body in a number, but it's kind of interesting to look at the algorithm of your blood sugar going up and down, or your ketones going up and down, along with your symptomology. So if you put those two together, they match and mesh quite well. And so... um I noticed that, uh, like, 
people eating too much protein, let's say men eating over hundred grams of protein. And it, it really came to light when I was working with a guy who was six foot four. And if his protein went over 85 grams of protein, his blood sugar would spike. And so I was like, wow. Meal. Huh? No, per, per, yeah. 85 grams of total protein per day. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I've worked with like over 8,000 people and I have them all get glucometers. So I'm not guessing any of this stuff. And, uh, it's also understanding their, their, um, their ketones and their glucose. Now, a lot of people, we also have to factor in that people don't have enough stomach acid, right? They're having a hard time breaking down. They're not producing enough enzymes to break down proteins. We've got people who are chronically dehydrated. Um, people, we have to factor in all of these things when we're trying to factor in the amount of protein. Mm. I mean, if you have a low GFR, if your kidneys are functioning at a low rate and you're trying to eat two pounds a day, how's that going to help you? Right. If you're having a histamine response to a certain quality of food, how's that going to help you? So I noticed that when people are eating too much protein, their ketones would tank or their energy would tank and their blood sugar would spike. And when they would get into that sweet spot zone, they would feel amazing if they could hold that zone for a while. Mm. And that is why I have men eat under 100 grams of protein. Now, he, his, his allotment went up to 85. This is a guy who lives at six foot four. Wow. Yes. Yeah. So most men, I, I kind of figure like if you become insulin sensitive, the need for all that protein goes down exponentially. So, uh, yeah. And women, it's between. So men, I typically it depends on your activity level and how, your size, but between 60 and 100 grams of protein a day. And for women, it would be between if you're like four foot 11, it'd be between like 48 to about 70 ish grams of protein per day for women. And what is your split on that? Like how many meals is that split over? Right. Typically. Okay. So this depends on somebody's uh, blood sugar, if they're dysglycemic or not. So if people have blood sugar issues, they're eating, you know, they're eating three meals and, and two to three snacks. So this could be three meals or five, but tiny, you know, lar larger or tiny. I don't have people eat all this meat. You know, I'm the anti-fasting. So you probably fast, you probably have high protein. I'm against all of that hardcore. Um, you know, we start looking at hunter gatherers. They weren't feasting every day, mm -hmm. and I'm noticing a lot. In, uh, noticing a lot of people with um, with uh, like binging disorders. So they'll fast in the day, and then they'll binge on protein at night. Then their electrolytes tank, and then their kidney function goes down. And I see it over and over again. So the people are talking to me, right? I don't need to look at a study. I can just look at all the people that I work with over time. So. Yeah. Um, uh, I also base things on like their fat based on if their gallbladder is functioning properly, mm. right? If they're producing enough lipase, if they have enough stomach acid to break down their foods, pretty much if you're hypoglycemic, I'm not having you eat no one meal a day. I'm not having you fast. I'm not having you uh, just eat three meals a day. These people are crashing. They're not getting into ketosis. They're not. And, um, they're not feeling well. And a lot of people don't even realize that they don't feel well. They're looking at the weight on a scale. They're looking at the fact that their skin cleared up for, for the moment or certain types of inflammation goes down. But if you're going to do this for 16 years, you better make sure that, you know, you don't rob from, what is it? Peter to give to Paul, mm -hmm. like you might feel good in one way, but you might lose in another way. You've got to look at certain things. A lot of women, one thing I've noticed over the years is, uh, with the macros is that women were having such extreme, gnarly, hardcore thyroid symptoms. They'd be like, no, I had my TSH tested. I'm fine. I'm like, that is a rough indication. You have to do a full panel. And I would have people do full panels twice, six weeks apart. Because even they can't, doctors cannot see if this thyroid hormone is getting into the cells to be actually utilized. So there are so many moving parts on this. And I think that a lot of people, and you, if you've seen my videos, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty blunt. A lot, a lot of people who preach the, these type of ideologies, um, you got to look at the individual. Most people are damaged.
you know, most people can't digest food very well. They've got sensitivities. They've got deficiencies in everything. They don't sleep well. They don't breathe right. They don't exercise right. They don't walk right. They've got stress. And then you put them on a diet where on, on, um, on paper, it looks like healthier than a standard American diet, but because their body's used to that. And then you go from that to this, all of a sudden they become dysglycemic and the hair starts falling out. Right. So, yeah. Have you seen, because I, I would see that there's some worries with women eating that low of protein. Have you seen any issues with hair and skin and nails as, or not as long as they're in ketosis? No, if their fats are high, it's not about the protein. Hmm. If their fats are high, they're good. They feel good. Like these, these thyroid symptoms calm down. Their sleep improves. But if they eat high protein, it's a wrap. It's over. It's not doing it. They feel terrible on high protein. And I have a series called Real People with Real Stories, and they all say the same thing. And I can keep interviewing person after person after person. And they almost say the uh, the identical thing. Wow. Now, like, like I said, people don't know their bodies. They're going to tell you that they feel fine. But look at them. Right. They're not fine. So typically, like, give me a rundown of someone who has 40 grams of protein a day or 50 grams of protein over three meals and some snacks, how would that, how would that pan out? So we got to be specific. A person who would eat, I would never have anybody do like more closer to 50 grams. Okay. If they did 50 grams of protein a day, this is somebody who's like under five feet tall. So is that a, you know, so maybe 60, I get women 60, who are four foot 11. Yeah. Huh? 60, 70 yeah. grams. Would you just space that out over three meals? Easy, easy, no brainer. You're eating fatty, fatty cut of meat. Let's say you do, um, people wake up in the morning and do, uh, three egg yolks and two ounces of liver. Hmm. And then, or they'll have, uh, two ounces of pork belly and three egg yolks. For example, that's, that's low protein. Right. But if you put, uh, 60 grams of fat on the plate, you're not going to be hungry. Hmm. I'm not doing this high protein, low fat thing. Mm -mm. And then let's say three hours later, they could have a piece of bacon or an egg yolk, or they can have something fatty or like a half of an avocado. So the snacks aren't actually to feed anybody. They're to, to stabilize blood sugar, hmm. right? Be because of this hypothalamus pituitary adrenal, the HPA axis of not to, to stay even with your blood sugar. So if they eat something, it's literally a couple bites. It can be like two tablespoons of ground beef with a tablespoon of some type of animal fat. And then for lunch, they can have three to four. This would be a woman. Three to four ounces, because you said 60 to 70 uh, or, or 50 to 70, three to four ounces of, of, um, of fatty meat mm. with another, another 45 to 60 grams of protein. And then they could have avocado for the potassium or for the fiber, or they might do just a little bit, a palm full, a, a, a golf ball size of a cruciferous vegetable that's cooked on that plate. And then if they're having hypoglycemia, they could have the carnivore latte, which could be a hot glass of water with two raw yolks in there. And if they have no gallbladder issues, then a tablespoon of fat, and that could be a, 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 something they can drink right? To keep that afternoon crash from happening. And then they'll have a dinner that mimics uh, lunch, but maybe perhaps without vegetables. Because right. I like people to ride that line of carnivore now. Right, right, right. Now, in ter do you talk about percentages? Like, it seems like you're probably 80, maybe even closer to 85% fat. Um, yeah, I, I don't talk percentages because people can't visualize that. I talk macros mm. because I could have 85, you know, or 80, 15, five or whatever on, um, on a thousand calories. Right. And then people will do that. You know, it's just, people have this wrong concept and I don't even count fat on the, on the pan. I only count what you put on your plate or in your mouth. I want to go as high as possible. If your gallbladder is functioning properly, then we want to go high fat, right? not high protein. So say someone's gallbladder isn't, because I, I know people who have problems with their gallbladder. Do you suggest digestive enzyme? What do you suggest for these individuals? Yeah. To be honest, I would say that 85% of 
of women that I speak to have a gallbladder issue underlying that they're not aware of. Right. And now men, it's growing too. Men are jacked these days. I mean, like I've done videos lately on like heavy metals and phthalates and forever chemicals and all these things completely destroy men. And now they are estrogenic and aromatizing and then they have problems with their gallbladder. So or their whole biliary duct system, their organs aren't functioning properly. Their liver is not functioning properly. These people, ALT, ALT and AST, but um, for people who've got a gallbladder issue, if you're not aware of it, first thing I do in a consultation is I'll ask, are you bloated? Are you nauseous? Do you feel have an aversion to eating more than like people are like uh, when they, when they go over their macros in a consultation, I said, well, tell me what your macros are. And they start breaking down everything. And I was like, tablespoon of fat. And they're like, yeah, I eat a lot of fat. I was like, tablespoon. Like I have about eight for breakfast. So, you know, well, I feel really full. So I'm like, full? What is this sensation of full? Because typically when people feel like, not that their stomach's pushed out, but they're like, oh, I can't eat anymore. I'm like, mm, there might be a little sludgy gallbladder going on. So um, I'll start saying things like, have you, have you ever tried to do apple cider vinegar uh, shots or lemon water? Or have you ever tried ox bile or tutka or lipase or taurine or glycine or or uh, milk thistle, these are all the different supplements or betaine HCL, all of these things that will help you digest. I try not to have people do like complexes of things. I hate complexes. I hate when you mix stuff, take what you need and you don't need other things. Like I've noticed people who, who have a, a normal functioning gallbladder and they take ox bile, they feel, they don't feel well. Right now you're putting too many bile salts within the body. So I pay attention to all these little details. Um, but if they look, if they're looking like they've got those symptoms, like greasy stool or it's clay colored, or they've got a shoulder blade, blade pain or do bloat it, whatever. I'm like, try it, uh, under the dose and I'll have them do a lipase and, uh, separate from concentrated lipase and then, and then an ox bile. And, um, then there's a problem with that too, because people are having histamine responses to these, you know, these bile salts. So, um, I will move things around based on people's symptoms. If they're looking like they have histamine issues, I might try, um, something as simple as milk thistle with some lemon water. And then if that doesn't work, I'll try taurine, you know, if they're reacting to ox bile. So there's different things that you can do. There's also gallbladder massages. There's also gallbladder flushes. Mm. There's also, um, you know, just getting your stress down to, and, and having your liver function properly and pooping and all this kind of stuff. So all the systems can start working because if you just have sludge, then you can unthickify it. So it's not like most of the time, I would say most of the time, these, one of these supplements, there's so many, and you take a certain one, depending on what the, the individual sure because this histamine issue love it now we talked a lot about fat protein let's talk a little bit about carbohydrates obviously you said that was the easiest one uh, to kind of nail early on do you go more net carbohydrates and do you ever bump up your carbohydrates or for the last 15 plus years you've been this is where i'm at i'm like no if you're gonna do this let's focus on the fat okay Let's not focus on the carbs. These are people who've got food addictions. You know, they want a diversification of, of plant source foods. And because I tried carnivore for a short stint, I was like, you know, this, I've got my theories on that. Why it's no one can, should do carnivore for the long term, strict carnivore. You know, some people like one guy's like, I'm a research scientist and she's full of shite and all this kind of stuff. But proof is in the pudding of people's examples of doing a carnivore diet. And then all of a sudden they can't eat a bro They can't eat broccoli anymore. They used to be able to eat broccoli. Now they can't eat broccoli. Now they feel bloated. Now they feel, feel sick. So I keep it in for those reasons for that prebiotic fiber. Um, but I don't really count to I used to count a uh, total total. Now I'm just like as, as, as little as possible. When I speak to people, you simplify it right? Do the cruciferous brassica family. Keep it simple. I'm not doing any ketchup or sugar that's in some food, but it's only under five. I'm not doing any of that. We take it all out. 
Just yeah. take, take, take. You probably haven't had a refined carbohydrate in probably 15 years. 16 years. 16 years. Wow. At all. That's incredible. Not for not once, no wine, no nothing. That's correct. So if you would probably be at a point where if you ever did have that, it would it would cause an issue just because you never had I probably that yeah. Life. A histamine issue probably because prior to doing that, I was having some histamine issues. So I'd probably rage back candida. Like my body, like the spores would be like, hello, we're awake again. Right. Um, no, I look at that stuff as nasty now. I think it's disgusting. I just do. I feel like we have been lied to. And yes, it would be great to have the gut of a hunter gather. Like I'm so jealous, not exposed to any like heavy metals and chemicals and all this nonsense um, or whatever's been happening, happening the last three years. None of that garbage. Um, but, um, yeah, like I look, when I look at like pastries and ca carbs and sugars, I, it looks like slave food to me. Mm -hmm. So with all of your clients, it's, it's, it's super interesting. Cause I think people are going to be like, what the heck? Um, so people, people you've worked with, like clients you've worked with, what's the, are there things, cause you don't, you don't talk about you said you don't track carbohydrate intake necessarily with them. Have you seen any of them have trouble with some of these uh, or flex in and out, or they're just like, they're working with you. They are strict in and you are, you're all in sort of thing. Yeah. Well, nobody's all, I mean, everybody's all in every console. No, not a single person challenges me, not even for a second. The only thing people challenge me on, to be honest, is going to bed early and getting off coffee. That's slave food to me. No. Coffee is a, is a trillion dollar business. It's slave food. So no, people are fracked up. Their bodies are in trouble. And um, if you need coffee, there's a problem. My ass is 55, right? Natty. No HRTs. Let's go. Let's get it in. No caffeine. So, nothing. No. And I'm, I mean, I'm 55. Yeah. And so to be at this age and to be able to, to have done this for this long. And I know the pitfalls in my own experience. And I know the pitfalls in, in people that I have consultations with or, or the public at large, it's so easy for me to see everything almost like x-ray vision through everything. So yeah, I'm like, I feel like today more than ever before in the history of humanity, we have to take back our lives. They are trying to destroy us. So I look at all of that as slave food now. And once in people who follow me, they know I talk this way. Mm -hmm. And because I have so many success stories, I don't have failure stories. You're not gonna have a, somebody do a consultation with me and be like, I work with Steph and oh, I just, she had me do this and that and it, no. People are gonna say, I went through a stressful event. I got a divorce. Somebody died in the family. And I couldn't hold it together. Mm. And I went back to this comfort food. Right. Mm. But nobody walks in and goes, you know, people know what they're there when they, when they do consultations with me, they know the, what I've been preaching for years and they're ready. And they, they look at me and they go, well, this girl's done it. You know, I escaped California and went to Texas and documented the whole journey and the excuse me, the whole stressful journey and why I left and all of these things, which I will not say in this, but, um, people understand that I'm not perfect, that I go through difficulties in life as well, because, you know, you can look at some gurus and think that, you know, nobody ever shows the, the difficulties in life. It's like, everything's so easy. No, it's not. And so I often say that gurus are full of shite. And I said, I said, they could be the nicest people on the planet, but th we're all human. And if you put your own bias inside anything you explain to people, you have to use people for a, as an example. So if people fall off the wagon, then I'm going to learn what's going on. Talk to me. What's going on? You know, that's almost like the beginning conversation. They'll be like, well, how far sh back should I go? Should I go back to when I was born? I said, yeah. Were you breastfed? Were you vaginally birthed? Like, what was your childhood like? Would you, what did you eat when you're dealing with people with severe disease or histamine or obesity or diabetes or high blood pressure, all these disgusting medications that, you know, doctors will put these individuals on. So 
Yeah, I'm a bit. I'm I'm hardcore. You can see I'm I'm hardcore for sure. And then one last thing on the carbohydrate intake on the fiber piece. So you leave in some cruciferous vegetables depending upon the individual how they're responding to it, um, and that's their that's their primary method of gaining fiber. Is that right? Yes. Well, I, the reason for the fiber is I've noticed that if you're starting to have histamine responses on carnivore then maybe your diamine oxidase has begun, begun to tank. And perhaps, or perhaps your, your, you, you, your bacteria, the microbiome become out of whack without the presence of fiber ever. Sure. So then you might have a cascade of all these issues go down if you're not getting in fiber, not for pooping, but for everything else that is balancing your whole system. Right. So that's why I have the people keep it in. And if they keep it in, it tends to do everything. It keeps them from binging. Um, it keeps them from um, their stool issues because we're not doing tons and tons of psyllium husk and fiber. Um, like I said, you don't you're not supposed to technically need fiber to use the bathroom. But I'm like, but if you're coming from a stuck ileocecal valve or the valve is the flap is, you know, broken and your stomach acid is super low and you're just, you got a jacked up gut and then you go and do carnivore. And now, you know, you're just constipated that, that, mm -mm. Right. so we keep a little fiber in. Okay. I like that. Not that you need it, but you might need it just because your gut's not used to not having it. Sure. Sure. And then on protein, one of the things I just thought of, like, we know that there is probably going to be a difference in glucose response from a, a ribeye versus 40 grams of straight whey protein. Say someone drank a protein shake. Do you factor that in at all or is it just, hey, this is... this? No, 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 no. I don't have people eat protein shakes because I, I find it to be slave food. I call it slave food. But anything... The, the difference in protein... We don't... Yeah, I mean, if you're eating... You know, if you're eating, let's say, if you have a really fatty cut of pork belly, right. go for it. Right. You know, then I'm not going to be like, oh, no, you've hit your, you know, in weight, you've hit your, you know, 115 gram weight or your five ounce weight max. So the fatty cuts really make a difference between how much in every individual and when you're doing a consultation, every single person and what they like or what they can tolerate, there is no... You know, every there people um I'll have um downloadable meal plans on my site and I'm like, I'm telling this is general. This may not work for you. I'm just gonna let you guys know so you are not confused at all. A lot of people are like, just tell me what to eat and I'll eat it. I go, No, we gotta figure out can you digest this? Can your does your gallbladder work properly? And do would you like eating this food the majority of the time? And then we start kind of looking at what the protein allotment is. I have a question back. You're asking a lot about protein. I presume that you have people eat a lot more. Uh, it depends. So I don't work one-on-one -on -one with individuals, um, but typically what we see in the research is it's optimized at about 30 grams. It depends on the individual, like you said, about 30 grams per meal. Um, so it, some of those recommendations would fall in line with what you're saying. So there are some studies that show that it's very difficult to gain fat on a higher protein diet. Now, I used to eat that way. I do not eat that way anymore. Um, but like where they've done studies where people have eaten like 250 grams of protein over their, their basal calorie load and not gain fat because um, it's, a, it's a hard macronutrient to gain on. But I think to your point, it depends on the type of protein. I don't think all proteins are equal. Absolutely. To me, this is, and please don't take me personal, but I'm going to be Stephanie for a moment. Sure. That's nonsense. Who is the person in the study? Okay. Anybody eating that much protein, if you went and ate that much protein, look at your blood sugar. If you have dysglycemia and hypoglycemia, that huge heavy protein meal is going to put you to sleep. Take, to me, the studies are nonsense. Look at real people right? Because to do a study, you'd have to take people so similar mm -hmm. and then put them together and have them do the exact same thing. Right. So because an individual didn't gain weight doesn't mean maybe they've got good glute 4 receptor development. Maybe they can uptake and use the glucose very easily and the next person cannot. Right. No. For sure. And, and that's, it's an, it's a very, very interesting approach. Um, 
like the more therapeutic approach is that's Steve Finney. Some of Volick's earlier work was on that as well. Um, but yeah, for sure. Now talk to me a little bit about um, some of the things that you recommend for people on keto, like to avoid this concept of the keto flu. You, you know, you face people all the time. They're like, Stephanie, I'm worried. I'm going to go through this transition period. And I'm going to feel horrible. What are some tips that you have for that? You know, Ryan, first I got to say, I think it's really cool to hear these questions. I haven't heard these types of questions in years because everybody's talking about carnivore. So I'm kind of over carnivore. So I like hearing <laughs> these types of questions. Um, the keto flu, which is a flu that can be on carnivore as well. Yep. But keto flu is an umbrella for everything that makes you feel like crap. So that can be um, a histamine response where you've got uh, rashes or headaches or mucus or tired or feeling sick or you're bloated or you got diarrhea. Um, uh, so I would say that or your hair's falling out, constipated. I would say um, to really, really make sure to start off that you are balancing your electrolytes. Mm. And also prior to doing this, I would have a conversation with yourself because if you're doing this for weight loss, you know, you need to think twice. You need to do this for the therapeutic benefits, because if you're happy, if you're healthy on the inside, you're going to be healthy all the way out to the outside. So you have to really you know, if you're trying to do this to lose weight, you're probably not going to lose the weight you want. You're probably going to lose a bunch of muscle. So getting into ketosis is not an easy thing. And it, I've told people it takes a very long time. And the people who really are patient and want this will get into ketosis and the rest won't. So the keto flu symptoms can be also like chronic fatigue and having any type of flare ups happen. So what I suggest is to make sure that your electrolytes are in balance. That's why I have people eat avocados, but a lot of people have an avocado allergy. So then we might switch over to, um, uh, excuse me, potassium citrate okay. and, and try to deal with this uh, avocado allergy of trying to get people to do more seafood because it's got higher, like shellfish have higher amounts of potassium meat broth instead of bone broth to get the potassium from in the water from uh the uh from the meat stock or broth um i would say to get your potassium in that's a huge one i think it's hyperkalemia you want to get that potassium in because you can damage your body over time your your heart needs to get enough oxygen so i would say that magnesium potassium um i don't know if you're sponsored by any of these companies but i'm gonna say it I cannot stand electrolyte powder junk. I don't like it. I think that you need to go and find what you need. I don't like potassium chloride. I think it's dangerous. I've had a few people have some kidney issues from potassium chloride. So we try to get our electrolytes first from food. And if that doesn't work for any histamine issues, then we're going to start having to go the supplemental route and only take what you need. Never keep adding on to a broken body if you don't need it. So that's why I don't like multivitamins. They're garbage. But ele electrolytes also um, and drinking enough water and don't drink too much water because you don't want to dil dilute the sodium in your body. There's also going to bed extra, extra, extra early, um, following a circadian rhythm, getting your feet in the dirt, um, breathing properly. There's also understanding the quality of food, which is very, very important. The thing about too much protein, I can't stand when people are eating too much protein. No hunter gather would be eating all that protein if they didn't need to, because people are having blood sugar issues or having to, they're becoming very dysglycemic. I've worked with diabetics that prove that when you have too much protein and the average person, I'm talking not talking about athletes and some to me studies are stupid. I just don't like them. Sorry. Um, not all of them, not all of them, but a lot of them, most of them after the last three years, you got to convince me that what you're doing is objective. But I would say that too much protein is what's giving a dysglycemic reaction to people. You're talking about weight loss. I'm talking about total health. Mm. So people have got thyroid issues aren't going to, you know, like, are you losing, are you losing fat? Are you losing muscle? Are you a man? Are you a woman? You might have more men uh, be interested in you, or you might just have women because more women are following a ketogenic diet. I get a lot of women because I'm a 55 year old woman. Mm. And so they're, they're not, they're broken. They're not going to fit this, you know, athlete that was able to eat 250 grams of protein and not gain weight or not have any dysglycemic reactions or any insulin issues from eating all that protein. So that to me is another uh, 
a keto flu symptom is crashing. Mm. Um, so I like for people who have any issues with their sleep or any issues with their blood sugar to try to eat every couple of hours to, to, uh, mitigate the potential, um, uh, keto flu symptoms. And the other thing is the thyroid. That's another keto flu symptom that people are not aware of, but they might become constipated or they might have, like I said, lethargy or their hair starts falling out or thinning. That's a huge one is the thyroid becomes affected by people not understanding what their body can handle because Linda, Linda's husband's daughter's cousin, a husband's friend who work across the street did amazing on keto. That has nothing to do with you. Right. Or the fact that I'm in great health doesn't mean that you're going to be in great health, which is why I don't show people what I eat. Right. And do you recommend people in general salt their foods? Yeah, of course. You don't salt your foods, you're going to run into a whole mess of health problems. A hundred percent. And is there any like traditional table salt or do you use a specific type like Himalayan or Celtic Celtic salt? I, yeah, because I'm finding out there's a lot of lead. I'm hardcore. Yeah. There's lead free mama. She's got a website. She's like, she found it in the Redmond's real salt, the Himalayan salt, but not the, the Celtic sea salt off the coast of France. So that's what I do now. Got it. Great tips on uh, uh, how to avoid keto flu. Those are those are those are great. I think a lot of people go through that experience, have no idea what to do. One of the other things that eat, yeah. eat a lot of fat. Yes, yes. And one of, one of the things that you talk a lot about, and you clearly do it a lot, is exercise. Uh, is that something you talk about with a lot of your clients? Like, hey, exercise, movement can also help accelerate you through the keto flu, and this is why it's important. Yeah, every every uh, client we talk about their job, their stress, their children. Um, we talk about their sleep, and then we always talk about exercise. Even if they're like, "I have chronic fatigue," I'm like, 10 minutes. We're gonna do some time under tension. We're not gonna do 15 second negatives. We're gonna do three. We're gonna do time under tension. We're gonna focus on breathing, and you're gonna do this 10 minutes a day, and then you're gonna work yourself up each three weeks. Love and that. add another five minutes. Love that. And what does your schedule look like? Like you, do you do a lot of resistance training, uh, cardio, high intensity interval training? What's that look like? I hate hit training because, um, first of all, I just didn't like it anyway as a kid, even though I was an athlete. But again, a lot of people have adrenal issues and thyroid issues, and their hair starts falling out trying to do all that hit training. Hit training is not going to make you lose the weight. You got to get your hormones in balance. I think people focus too much on weight loss and not trying to look at their existing health and try to understand what's going on with their hormones. So never hit training. Uh, no, that's somebody who knows that they are balanced, that can go to sleep uh, early and breathe and let the stress out. Um, I have people focus on resistance training, body weight training. I like calisthenics, aesthetics. I like uh, resistance training. I like to do handstand push-ups. You know, just like if you're on my Instagram, you'll see me do handstand push-ups without a wall. You know, thanks because I used to be a pro skateboarder. So I busted my knee as a pro skateboarder. I had 10 surgeries on my left knee, so I can't do any cardio at all, at all. Okay. So how am I able to stay as lean as I am in my mid 50s if I can't do cardio and that's why I know that this whole you need to do cardio to be lean is subjective so um cardio is good but I mean like hit training like really that type of endurance you know really putting stress on the adrenal the fight or flight system right and that kind of leads into one of my last questions which is talking a lot about uh, intermittent fasting I, I, I you are not a proponent of fasting at all and does that have to deal with the adrenals what's your what's the reason behind that yeah well we're we're living in a toxic reality so no hunter gatherer is going to be like no i'm not going to eat that would be ridiculous if they're not going to eat they're going to rest it was all about energy conservation you expend energy when you need to if you're starving to death, you try to rest and conserve energy for a hunt. You don't just willy nilly run around, pay bills, deal with like having to wear a diaper on your face, having to do all this kind of stuff. Like we have complicated society to the point where it's, it's awful. People don't do ice baths and intermittent fast because they're trying to, you know, lengthen their DNA, their telomeres and all this kind of stuff. They do it because they want to weigh less on a scale. These are wrong motives. Anytime someone wants to lose 
fat on a scale and do they do these desperate things. We're living in a I'm from Hollywood, California. By the way, I moved to Tennessee to the country, get me away from a city. But with that said, um, I'm from Hollywood. And the pressures of beauty, you're you're how old are you? Thirty. You're thirty. Thirty. You're a puppy. Puppy. Baby. You're puppy ish. <laughs> and you're a dude. So your perception of reality is completely different from these middle-aged people who hire you, mm-hmm. who you work with per se, or who you talk to. Um, intermittent fasting for a guy who's 30, who has a strong gut wall, um, who knows he gets rest, who knows all the right things to do, might have some advantages at some point of this concept called autophagy. But for the rest of real ass people, no, they are exhausted. They cannot stabilize their blood sugar. They're dysglycemic. They're hypoglycemic. They're hypoglycemic. Hyper and hypo, they have all of these blood sugar issues. They're stressed to the freaking guild. So it's, and then there's the access between the thyroid, your freaking reproductive system. And, you know, maybe you as a, like I said, well, you're 30. There's a lot of guys with low testosterone. They have chronic fatigue. You're going to have them go out and do fast and do some HIIT training? No way. Watch their testosterone tank even more. So I hate fasting. I think it's the new um, eating disorder that creates people to do binge dis- disorder, disordered eating because me at 55 and like I could fast maybe for six months before my body goes F you because I do too much. I've got two horses and two donkeys on 10 acres. I do everything myself because I moved to a place by my by myself and I go to the gym every day. There's only so much that your bucket can hold before you spill over with stress. And people are stretched out. They're chemically, they are so, they're so toxic right now. They are so, they don't even know their hunger pangs and people are not eating and they go into this starvation of like fight or flight mode. They're like, no, I'm fine. I'm not hungry when I, when I'm not eating. Like, no, you're barfing out cortisol. Okay, you're eating up your muscle and your collagen. Look at these people who fast. You're 30, so you don't see it on your face. Look at these people when they get older and they're like, they're emailing me and they're constantly, I I, I started having crepey skin. I start being dark around my eyes. I have my kidneys hurt, my back hurts. I'm like, oh, you're, you're dehydrated because you were fasting. People don't know how to fast. If you fast because you're having an inflammatory response to something, do a 24 hour fast. Right. Give your body relief, but to sit there and fast because you think that you're going to be, you like fitter, stronger, faster, nonsense. And you've never seen it in any of these middle-aged people who are completely jacked up and all of a sudden they fasted for three months and they're the healthiest people in their life for the rest of their life. It's a farce. There's too many lies on the internet and people don't take the time. And I'm not saying you, but a lot of people, you need to look at real people. You can't go by you. We we cannot go by what happens to Stephanie. Stephanie's another kind of strong. I used to be a pro skateboarder and only skated with guys. In my day, I was skating with Tony Hawk back in the day. So it takes a certain type of personality. But what about when you're stressed to the guild and you got bills to the guild and you're so used to eating garbage food and you're watching TV all day and you can't? You know how many men are on HRTs now? Well, how many? Well, uh- Like I'm in a freaking small town in Tennessee and I'll meet these young guys and the doctor's like, Oh, we'll just put you on TRT. Mm -hmm. The solution isn't quick fixes. You got to go within yourself and look at what your body needs. It isn't to just fast. Fast isn't, you know, you got a pimple fast. You got an elbow ache fast and people literally take it as such. And they're tanking. They're exhausted. But they lost weight on a scale. So now they become subjective and think, you know, well, I lost 30 pounds. I'm like, what did you lose? Did you do a DEXA scan before? Did you get dumped in water? What did you lose? How do you feel? How are your energy levels? Every little moving part matters on the basic person. So that that I I could go on and on and on about the nonsense of fasting. So you're talking, are you talking purely like prolonged fasting or are you talking like short, even, even? 
you feel the same with shortening people's eating window. Like, hey, instead of eating, you wake up at eight o'clock in the morning, just maybe wait till 10 o'clock to eat and then finish eating about an hour. Too many people with dysglycemia. So you just eat as soon as you wake up. That's right. Because that's going to tell the hypothalamic, the hypothalamic response, the hypothalamus, it's going to understand that food is coming in. It's a cortisol regulation. People aren't sleeping at night, right? They have inverted cortisol. Cortisol is too high at night, too low in the morning. And then they're going to go fast and push themselves. Their adrenals have to start. me. Okay. Food is energy. It's just energy and it's tools to fix the car. Why do I have to not eat? Because of some concept called autophagy. I thought you were going through that by being in ketosis. Mm -hmm. Why do you have to fast on top of that? We have complicated life too much. Food is not bad. They used to tell me when I was a kid, eat like a, a breakfast like a king. You know, it's going to set your blood sugar. It's going to, uh, you know, it's going to, it, it's going to curb that, the, 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 uh, the, the binging in the evening, the crashing in the afternoon, like this adrenal response. So if we actually go into real people, not the studies, but the real people, because I remember when keto came out, they did a twin study for 30 days. Hell, it takes people a year to adapt. A year to adapt. So if you use that twin study, it, everybody's going to be about, look, look how bad keto is. And people said that keto is bad for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. So are people going to do this with fasting? It's starting to happen now. Oh, well, women shouldn't fast for a very long time. Okay, well, why? Well, because their hair's falling out, right? They're estrogen dominant, their progesterone tanks. So if you you have to look at real people, because you look like, a, you, well, you said, you mentioned studies. The fasting thing to me is absurd. Food is not bad. When you're getting up, yes, would a hunter-gatherer be able to get up and have breakfast? Not necessarily, but we are modern humans. We've developed an unstable blood sugar. Our hormones are completely jacked. So if somebody gets up and eats in the morning, I'm not having them eat the two pounds of beef. They might eat something very small to calm down that adrenal response that you don't have to relieve extra cortisol because you're driving a freaking Bugatti. You're driving a, a expensive car with no gasoline in the tank. It just becomes a product of a modern human to put you into homeostasis by eating something small every couple of hours. You don't overwhelm your digestive system if you're eating something small. You don't have to eat all this food like people are starting because people have developed food disorders and binging because they're fasting. You fast while you sleep. Why do you have to continue fasting? For this concept of autophagy and then come, come the afternoon, you can't stop that person from eating? Right. So what do you, how, what's your reference of, of how long you recommend people sleeping? I know you said super, super early. So you recommend people eating as soon as they wake up and then trying to go to bed at, around what time? I think that if, it depends if you have a day job or not, but I try to, uh, you know, first, second or third shift worker. I really feel that people should follow nature as best as they can, even though we're modern humans. Hmm. So the circadian rhythm. If you know that you're on vacation or you're going to get up and chill and you're going to read a book, have at your fasting, right? Breathe, digest, rest, whatever. Just get yourself in a calm state. But if you know you're going to be running around or like a chicken with his head cut off 100 miles an hour, eat something small to pacify this hypo hypothalamus pituitary reaction, adrenal reaction. And so I'd have people come up, get up, and depending if they're on thyroid medication or not, because they have to wait 30 minutes for that nonsense. And um, I would have somebody eat something small. It, can, it doesn't, you don't have to eat like a king in the morning, just something small. And then, in, and everybody's schedule is different. So some people might eat something small and go to the gym. They might have one egg yolk and a teaspoon of fat and go to the gym, right? right? Something very, very small. And then they come back and they eat a normal breakfast. So I think that's more of the windows we're talking about. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner with snacks in between. You know, you try to eat something small when you get up or, or a little bit more if you know you're a stay-at-home mom or you're retired. And then um, 
uh, uh, try to get your workout anytime before three o'clock in the afternoon. So you don't like beat up your body and have cortisol begin to spike, you know, at, at the wrong time as, as melatonin wants to be secreted. So we just keep the workout at a good time. We keep that eating window at a tighter time. So in the evening you can just, re- uh, rest and not have to sit there and, and squish down and mulch down all this meat in the, at night. Because I notice that a lot of people, when they eat these heavy foods at night or later in the day, and then they can't sleep, they can't. Right. How's the body going to digest when you're like training for the Olympics to digest? So it makes more sense to have all the catabolic, everything that's more difficult in the day. This whole skipping food the most of your day and the eating at night has is so illogical. When you're at night, the body wants to rest. It doesn't want to go clock back, back into work and start working. So when you have your last meal, if you eat between five and six in the evening, now you can just clear all that out, go to bed and sleep. And your stomach doesn't have to sit there and start digesting. Right. So, and then you recommend people say they have their last meal, five or 6 PM, then probably you recommend getting to bed maybe by eight, nine, the latest. No, no. If, if you're a person like some people, like if you go to bed by six, then, I mean, eat by six, then you can go to bed by 10. If you're eating by five, you might be go to bed between 8.30 and nine like that. And if you have dysglycemia or you're, you've got hypoglycemia, then I might have them do something small that's easy to digest, like some ground turkey or some egg yolks if they don't have a histamine reaction to that. Um, histamine is a whole nother subject. Like, you can't just give general guidelines because so many people I work with have mast cell activation. So they couldn't even do like an egg yolk, but they might be able to do rabbit or turkey. And they might do something that's grinded down, that's easier to digest in a small amount and then go to bed. And then this helps or a little bit of fat with some fatty meat, hopefully. And then this helps their them sleep if they have hypoglycemia and tend to wake up all throughout the night. Right. So if someone's finishing eating by like five, um, right, they're having dinner around five and they're waking up and eating breakfast around eight, theoretically, couldn't you make the argument that that's an intermittent fast? That is their eating window of like, yeah. so that would be like, a, that'd be a pretty good fasting. That's a nine hour eating window, um, which is it's amazing. It's great. Cause you're not doing anything. Right. I think the, the body the challenges is the masses, like the masses do not follow any of that. They are eating from like six o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. Um, so the average person right now eats like well over 16, 17 hours a day. So I think there is still some form of intermittent fasting with, with the nine hours like you're recommending, but most people are eating Oreos at nine 30 at night and then going to bed at 10 o'clock. That there's obviously multiple problems with that, but that's the majority. That's the majority of society is eating right before bed and as soon as they wake up. So they're they're literally only fasting as soon as their eyes are asleep and are done, and as soon as they wake up, you know. But it's not really even this fasting thing. It's the fact that people are so stressed out with society today. They're they're using these pacification carbs to get to sleep. You know, they become hypoglycemic and then they fall asleep and then they wake up four times in the middle after in the middle of the night because the blood sugars boink, 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 all throughout the night. Right. So yes, technically I mean you could stop eating at five and going go to bed at ten if you know you're not gonna go and and freaking go to your kids, you know, practice in the evening somewhere and drive around all night or go to the nightclub. Yeah. Then that's a perfect time to do a, a more like a, a a fifteen hour fast or sixteen hour fast in that way. But to me, it's all about if you're not eating, you should be resting. Like I said, if you want to fast in the day because you know this is your day off from work and you know that you're not going to do a bunch of stuff, but why would you need to fast if you're eating something small and you're giving your body the electrolytes and the nutrition that you need for this broken body? Right, hundred uh, percent. One of the questions I. I want to wrap up with before we kind of go into our final four. Um, and those are like quick, quick hitters. But uh, you were on uh, Dr. Oz. I just want to know what that experience was like. Like, what was that? I, you documented kind of the, a little bit about it, but I would love to hear from you. What was that experience like? I know I've done so many things where I plan to do more documentation of it because it's still sitting in like files, the, the whole thing. Um, so they contacted me because the head producer was 
uh, they were following my dietary uh, plan for a year. Nice. So it's not like they were like looking for keto gurus in my case. It was like the head producer was like, she said that she was waiting for a keto episode to come and then invite me on. But then see, I refused. I refused. They tried to give me like a script. Mm -hmm. And I refused to say that animal fat was going to give you heart disease. So they took my part from this much down to this much. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm not going to say that. I'm not. And I even mentioned it online. I'm like, you guys are really conflicted to go on the show because they want me to talk about olive oil being a good keto fat. And it's nonsense. And, uh, they heard me say that they got pissed. Um, but that's who I am. Yeah. Um, I ended up going on the show. I said, I'm sorry. I don't know. You can't talk about the episodes. Um, but they had, what's his face from Pri primal. What's his name? Marxist. Um, yeah. And I was like, why are they putting him on? He was doing like paleo, like, this what? That was five years ago that was on that show or something? Oh. Like he had just jumped out of paleo. Like, why are you putting this dude on? I thought just thought that was absurd. He didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. Um it was a good experience. And um uh I I picked a subject that was non controversial, which was macros. Uh they had a bunch of people on that show and he was nice. He didn't know anything. He was he was very, very nice. Mm -hmm. Dr. Oz was very, very, he was like very sweet guy. All he did, does is read from a prompter. He looked tired as hell, but really, really, really nice. That was my experience. That's awesome. That's, that's, <laughs> that's incredible. Well, this has been incredible. I want to wrap it up with our final four. These are like quick hitters. And I think you'll knock these out of the park. Um, first question is, what's your favorite meal and favorite snack? Liver. For both? And liver. Yeah. So you actually enjoy liver. Like you love the taste. of liver. I love it. It's like, it's nature's candy and it's the most nutrient dense, dense food on the planet. Bomb. I was losing my 2020 vision. I was like going like this, like these older people. I was like, Oh, hell not. Nah. I started doing liver 2020 with that retinol eyes were turned insane liver. My body knew what was good. How do you eat it most? Um, I'm curious on that. Just personally, like, how do I do? You just how do I eat do it? Just, do you just like pop it? Do you cook it? Pan fry it. I don't do the raw thing because I I just you know I'm studying too much about. I have animals. Now there's bacteria. Just sear that. You know ringworm, ringworm, and pinworms and roundworms. Just sear the outside. Okay. Yeah. Um, favorite book of all time or something you're currently reading? Oh, I just read stuff about horses now, um, which the audience doesn't care about. <laughs> Now, I read a book years ago when I lived in Sweden, mm -hmm. and it was about a woman going to Yemen and getting stuck there. And I don't remember the name of the book because it was in Swedish. But yeah. That one. Um, sure. Yeah. All the books. I have piles and piles of books on health. That's not what, you get, what you're asking about. So that's not. Yeah. So horse, well, right, now, right now, horses, because you're, you're, you have a horse, right? You have one of them? I have two horses and two donkeys. Two horses. That's so I read about that at nauseam. Yeah. That's I buy a bunch of books on that, like stacks and stacks of books. <laughs> that's awesome. Third question is, what are you most excited about in your life right now? I feel most excited about waking up to the garbage that's going on in this world and learning that everything is a lie and that getting back to nature is the most important thing that all humans should try to understand to recapture who they really are. And I'm obsessed with watching the Amish because they literally live on nothing. And if there's a, a E, you know, with the P blast, we're screwed uh, with the M in the middle. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's about recapturing nature. Nothing else matters. I can go and talk about popular things and traveling and all these things I like to do. But the most important thing I think is to recapture my humanity and be human again. Amazing. Uh, and then what's one thing people can do today to improve their health? Turn off their TV mm. and the social media. That's a good one. That's a really good one. <laughs> this has been incredible. Thank you so much. Where can people find you? How can we support you? Uh, where can, where can we find all of your information? Yes. You can find me at stephanieperson.com. That's my website. Stephanie Ketogenics, my Instagram. Stephanie, the business as in the body business person is my Facebook. I do. I am going to uh, uh, do a challenge, a 30 day challenge. It's an educational challenge. It's not any weight loss, or quit sugar junk. It's going to be an awesome, all inclusive thing. So people can go to stephanieperson.com to learn more about that or 
to my channel, which is Stephanie Keto Person on YouTube and Stephanie Ketogenic on Instagram. And I have a, I have a course too. It's a month to month course where I cover all three diets because no one can just do a keto diet um, just like that. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. It was an absolute pleasure having you on. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you.